Welcome to Truth and Consequences with Doug Papa, episode number 18 for September 29, 2020. I am continuing my discussion of the formal statement of charges that were filed against Las Vegas Justice Court Judge Melanie Andrus Tobiason by the Nevada Commission on Judicial Discipline and the response and motion to dismiss those charges that were filed by Judge Tobiason's attorneys. Refer to podcast number 17, where I confirm Tobiason's claim to me during my May 7, 2018, on-the-record recorded interview with her, in which he stated that she had been in contact with FBI Special Agent Kevin White of the FBI Las Vegas Division's Public Corruption Squad. A court record pertaining to the charges filed against her by the Judicial Commission confirmed that Tobiason's phone records indicated nearly 200 calls to the FBI and 175 text message exchanges with the FBI. Tobiason told me that the information she was providing to the FBI involved underage sex trafficking and police corruption. Special Agent White, according to the court record, when questioned by the commission's investigator, replied that he doesn't comment on an ongoing investigation. Now, today's podcast. During my May 2018 interview with Judge Tobiason, she claimed that she had been providing information to Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department vice detectives during 2015 and 2016 relating to underage sex trafficking and unlicensed clubs. Tobiason said in that interview that the information she gave vice detectives was not followed up on because of the detectives were negligent and in September of 2016, a murder occurred at one of the unlicensed clubs, Top Notch. Once again, Judge Tobiason's veracity went up another notch in reference to her interview with me. According to those same court records that verified Tobiason's claim that she was in contact with the FBI, we now have a statement made by Clark County Sheriff Joe Lombardo, who runs the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department earlier this year, to the commission's investigator that bolstered Tobiason's statement to me about the vice detective's negligence, to say the least, and the murder. Shortly, you will hear audio excerpts from my May 2018 interview with Judge Tobiason where she adamantly stated that because of being ignored by the police detectives, not only led to the murder at Top Notch, because the business was never shut down, but Tobiason also said her concerns about Las Vegas pimp Shane Valentine led to the October 2016 murders of Sidney Land and Nehemiah Kaufman, a double homicide that is to this day unsolved. The response and motion to dismiss the charges filed by Tobiason's attorneys state, Tobiason's opinion in this regard is consistent with Sheriff Joseph Lombardo, who stated in his interview that the initial investigative team, quote, dropped the ball, unquote, and were admonished for it. Sheriff Lombardo was not the only one concerned about the police investigation in this matter. Detective Grimm had advised that when he heard the circumstances regarding the top-notch homicide, quote, I immediately recognized it as a place of business that Judge Tobiason had already mentioned to me prior to the actual homicide itself, unquote. Moreover, Detective Grimm had advised that the sheriff and other Metro, quote, bigwigs, unquote, met to inquire about why Tobiason's information was not followed up on to try and determine what happened. Grimm had described the meeting with the sheriff and the detective as follows. You get information, and you did nothing with it, and now we got a murder? You know, I mean, what the hell? Pretty much how meeting went. A lot of yelling and screaming and a lot of spit flying by the sheriff, because he was upset. A judge gave you some valid information, and you did nothing with it? And the vice detective says, yeah, I walked in there and something wasn't right, is what he said. Something wasn't right. And he says, and then what the hell did you do about it? Nothing. And now we have a murder. In the writ filed by Tobiason's attorneys on September 25th, they state, Detective Grimmett describes the sheriff as very upset about the, quote, botched, unquote, investigation. Quoting from Sheriff Lombardo's recorded interview with the commission's investigator, the writ states, quote, I brought the detectives in when I found out about the information associated with Top Notch, the clothing store, and the failure for us to investigate it, unquote. None of the excerpts of the exhibits mentioned by Tobiason's attorneys that I have referred to in this 
or other podcasts have been made public. Keep in mind what I discussed in podcast number 16. Judge Tobiasen told me multiple times in my interview with her in May 2018 that she had received confidential details about the investigation of the 2016 Land Kaufman double homicide from, from, a, from, a, excuse me, from a homicide detective whom she later identified in an email to me as Detective Jared Grimmett. Grimmett, when interviewed by the Judicial Commission's investigator, denied he gave any confidential information about the double homicide to Tobiasen. Somebody is not telling the truth here, and I believe that it is Grimmett. More on that in a future podcast. No doubt to me, he was providing information to Judge Tobiasen. Grimmett even confirms in his interview, as you just heard, that Judge Tobiasen had mentioned to him about Top Notch prior to the murder occurring there. Grimmett was in communication with the judge, either in a social or professional basis. Just to note, some of the documents filed by the commission and Tobiasen's attorneys are misleading. The Top Notch murder happened on September 25, 2016, outside that establishment. There was one victim, and the killer was caught and is currently incarcerated in Nevada State Prison. The bodies of Sidney Land and Nehemiah Kaufman were found in their apartment on October 27, 2016, both shot in the head. Those murders are still unsolved. Now, here are audio excerpts from Judge Tobiasen's on-the-record recorded interview with me on May 7, 2018, when she talks about top-notch and the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department vice detectives who ignored her concerns. Refer to the screenshots in this podcast. I will be playing the surveillance video from Top Notch that Tobias and mentions in the interview. That surveillance video was seized by homicide detectives and publicized at the time in an effort to apprehend the suspect. It is the only video that I know of that shows the inside of the After Hours Club. The murder occurred in the parking lot. The business is no longer in operation. Just to note, Tobiasen was fully aware of Marlon Brown, the owner of Top Notch, and his criminal activity as a pimp. She also refers to the other pimp as Reg. I will have additional comments after the audio excerpts. So about July of 2015, my daughter starts hanging out at a place in what we call Chinatown here in Las Vegas called Top Notch. It was a hip-hop clothing store that when I looked into it, realized it was not really a clothing store, it was a front for an unlicensed club, and also that they, on a regular basis, had young local high school girls hanging out in the club, um, dancing, there were, strip, there were stripper poles in the back of the club, there was a full bar, there were, you know, at night, if you watched the alley behind the club, you would see the people come in, you know, typical Mercedes, Range Rovers, Bentleys, Rolls Royce, whatever, they'd all pull in and you'd see the, the people that were getting out and you could see exactly what was going on. They'd go in through the alley back door and it was in fact an unlicensed club. Um, so in July of 2015, I start contacting detectives in White, asking them about this particular establishment. They tell me they have no knowledge of it whatsoever. I gather some additional information, find out that the two men who are running this club, both are convicted pimps, and uh, one of whom has had a case in front of me. He was a 34-year-old. I take that information to the police. I say, listen, these guys have young girls from, you know, local high schools hanging out in here every night. And from my understanding, they're entertaining in this unlicensed club. And at one point, one of the vice officers apparently walked in there about two o'clock in the afternoon, when I can assure you there was no activity going on, and reports back to me that it definitely appears to be suspicious. That's the only thing that was ever done in the entire year and three months or so that I was giving information to vice. They never follow up, they never do anything else. Uh, so what I do is I allow her to go and work there, but I watch it. I sit, I watch while she's there. And after about three weeks, she says she doesn't want to go back and I tell her, good, don't go back. Um, so 
But from my understanding, even after that, you know, occasionally she would hang out there. They would go hang out in the club. It was kind of like a hookah lounge slash strip club. Um, so I continue to tell the police this. I watch the back alley. I get license plate numbers. Vehicle makes the models. Tell them what's going on. Get the information on Marla Brown and Red and, uh, you know, express my concern repeatedly that there are 30-something-year-old pimps running this unlicensed club with all these underage girls hanging out there. And, the, and it's interestingly enough, the first time that I took the information to the police, I wasn't so concerned because I figured within a week, the police would be shut down. Well, clearly that didn't happen because I subsequently learned that not only did the police know about this place when I first started giving them information, they knew about a lot of places like this. And they were kind of untouchable. There were certain pits that were untouchable, and then there were certain pits that they would go after. The pits that were untouchable, from my understanding, is the pits who would play the game. They would pay the price. They would, you know, offer their girls, and they would get to do whatever they wanted, despite the fact that they were targeting, you know, judges, daughters, cops, daughters, etc. I learned pretty quickly that Shane Valentine was also untouchable. No matter what I said to the police about him, they never went after him. Um, so this is about September. This goes into September, October of 2015. Then my daughter kind of quits hanging out there. Occasionally she would go there, but mostly she wasn't going there. Um, December of 2015, I still continued to give information, even when my daughter was no longer going there. So they figured, not just my daughter that was in, in jeopardy. I then immediately contacted Vice again, and this was probably the fifth or sixth time I had contacted them in this particular period of time, July to December of 2015. Contacted them immediately, gave them his name, the address where she had gone, the fact that he had drugs and guns in the house and he was an ex-felon, and the conversation that he had had with my daughter, and the fact that it was clear that he was also had a, that he also had other girls working for him. Uh, that they, they did nothing. They said they would look into it. Um, I subsequently learned that not only did they know who he was, he was pretty much untouchable and they never even queried the address because they never had any intention of going after him. For a long period of time, I thought it was just they were lazy or they judged me because, you know, they figured why is she let her daughter do this? Um, you know, my theory was they should understand that when you're dealing with this kind of stuff, you try to do everything in your power to keep your child talking to you because the minute you alienate them, you basically send him into the lion's den. Nobody ever attempted to get a search warrant for his house, despite the fact that there was, you know, there were people who could say they saw guns and drugs, etc., in the house. That was the guard's repeating. She just happened to remember that he was the one on the other case, that he was the pimp, that even though he wasn't charged, she remembered his name. I had never made the connection until that moment. Now. Mind you, I am telling the police about Shane now for six months. And then I think, then I learned this detail and I freak out because now I realize, because I always had believed he was targeting certain types of girls or certain families. Now I knew for sure. So I called Vice again and I said, I have just learned that he is the same guy who pimped out the other judge's daughter. And they, seemed to be shocked. However, I now know that they knew exactly who he was and exactly who he had pissed out when I first gave his information to them. They knew he was the guy who had picked out this judge's daughter. They knew they, he had never been charged. They had never submitted a case on him and they'd never gone after him. I then called Vice and I told them, who'd you, again, ma'am, uh, who'd you talk to in Vice? Who are the detectives you're talking to? On that, the, the majority of the time I spoke to detectives Blues and Bies. That would be Kelly Blues and Al Bies. 
Little did I know at this time that they were both subjects of the federal investigation. I had no idea because what? it hadn't been made public yet. Um, so then I, I had also talked to Kathy Healy. I had talked to Greg Flores. I had talked to several others, you know, in passing. But those were the blue, BS and Blues were the ones I took most of the information to, but I had given information to Flores and had given information to Healy. Um, I also had talked to um, a detective by the name of Van Cleef. But, um, so at this time I call Blue and Diaz again. And I tell them that he was in court. And as soon as he left my court, he started contacting my daughter. I go, I don't understand why you guys won't do anything. This part, I mean, I'll say it, and I know it's being recorded, but you know, at the point that this story gets reported, there's certain things that you know, hopefully we can talk about not discussing just for my daughter's protection, you know? Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I contacted his attorney because it was now going on a year that I had been calling ICE and that they had done zero, absolutely no. So, uh, do we, I ma'am, ma'am, hold on for a second. Before you go any further, I don't, I don't want you to lose track. But could, can you um, phonetically spell the names of the, as best you can, of the vice cops you spoke to? I know Al B S is B E A S, but who were the others? That's correct. Kelly Booth is K E L L Y B L U T H. He is a man. His wife is a uh, prostitute. She's a D A. Her name is Jacqueline Booth. Um, then there's Kathy Huey. Kathy, I think, is with a C and not a K, and then last name is H-U-I. Gregory Flores, F-L-O-R-E-S. Greg Flores is one of the most corrupt individuals I've ever had the displeasure of learning about. Um, then there was a Van Cleef, and I'm sorry, I don't know his first name. It's D-A-N-C-L-E-E-F. I contact Shane Valentine's attorney. It's about July now of 2016. And because I know that the cops at this point aren't going to do anything, I call his attorney and I said, hey, you might want to get your client about this bed. If he talks to my, if he calls my daughter again, I'm going to take care of it myself. <laughs> so he does, he gives him a message. <laughs> uh, that, you know, we don't really want to report that. <laughs> but, you know, I was at the point where I thought if this guy's going to continue to mess with my daughter, clearly the police don't give a shit. They're not going to protect her. I spent a year trying to get them to do some sort of independent investigation and shut these places down. That I had given them. Shane Valentine was associated with a place called Milk Money, which is the same kind of thing as Top Notch. You know, it's like a front. They use all these clothing stores and strip malls and an area malls that look like clothing stores from the front, but they're actually unlicensed clubs. And they're all over town. Milk money is, from my understanding, from talking to people in the industry, is owned and run by Molly Mall. That should explain some things to you because Shane Valentine was associated with milk money. Molly Mall's people, in other words, pimps that worked under Molly Mall's permission, were pretty much untouchable. just like Ocean Fleming and Raymond Sharp said. So, which explains why they never ever went after Shane Valentine. So, he does get charged with the burglary, kind of hard not to since it's on videotape and they put it all over the news. Um, and, so while he's out on bail, on that burglary, and while I continue to go to the police, and while he continues to harass my daughter, the police continue to do nothing. During that time, from what I understand, he's still pimping out girls, he's still selling dope, and he's still burglarizing houses and stuff. But I continued to push it because at any time, there were several times I had conversations with Luke where he'd say, well, what's going on with your daughter? And I'd say, my daughter's fine. And he goes, well, what do you want us to do? And I go, well, just because my daughter's fine doesn't mean other people's daughters are fine. I said, this isn't just about my kid. This is about everyone's kid. So... Um, September 26th of 2016, it was a Sunday, I get a search warrant call from homicide. About halfway through the search warrant, 
we do telephonic search warrants here. About halfway through the search warrant, they give the address and the name of the location of the homicide. That location was Top Notch Clothing Store, the place that I had started to talk to Vice about July of 2015. It's now September 2016. Um, so Top Notch was still going strong as an after hours club with underage girls. And lo and behold, there's a murder there. So I get off the phone, I call, I call the Vice Sergeant, or I'm sorry, the Homicide Sergeant back and I explain to him that you know, I was concerned about my name being on the search warrant because these people knew who I was and they had kind of tried to get their hooks into my daughter. Um, but they had, you know, most likely gotten their hooks into other girls. Well, Ma'am, before you and, go any further, let me interrupt you. Where, where was Top Notch located at? At this point in time, Top, no Top Notch had moved. When I first, when my daughter first was aware of it and I was first aware of it, it was on Spring Mountain. I can get you the full addresses, but it was on Spring Mountain, and it was uh, between Valley View and Arville in what we call Chinatown. And then by the time it had the murder, the murder was there. It had moved to a location at the corner of Flamingo and Decatur, and it was on the southeast corner in a strip mall behind like a Blueberry Hill breakfast restaurant and stuff like that, it was a little strip mall. And again, I can get you the full addresses okay. um, if you need them. So the murder happens there. They have surveillance cameras and interestingly enough, they, the homicide guys call me and ask me if I'll show the pictures of these four people to my daughter. And I said, are you out of your mind? I said, there is no way in God's green earth that I'm going to have my daughter identify the shooter as a getaway driver in this video for you guys to, you know, I mean, they haven't protected her to this point. And she was like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. You're not going to use my daughter as your guinea pig. So, which turned out to be a really smart move on my part. Ultimately, they identify the shooter. They identify the getaway driver. Anyway, so that was October 26th. The following day, which was a Monday, I contact Detective Blues and I'm pissed. And I said to him, I go, I, think I, I said, I assume you heard about the murder at Top Notch. I'm not quite sure why you have blown me off for all this time. I go, but maybe now I have your attention. And I said, maybe now, since there's been a murder at Top Notch, and I asked you guys to investigate that a year ago, year and a half ago, and you knew what was going on there, I said, maybe now you'll investigate Shane Valentine. I said, he's out on bail on a burglary charge. He's got multiple felony convictions from when he was a juvenile and certified up as an adult. He's pimped out one judge's daughter. He's pimped out multiple police officers' daughters. He tried to pimp out my daughter. He's targeting certain families. And you guys just don't care. And I said, I have information on a girl who is at this moment working as a prostitute for him while he's out on bail on a burglary. Maybe you could do some investigation and do something about it. So he tells me he'll be at my office on Thursday afternoon. Thursday comes and goes, no call, no show. And what detective was that? So that, that was Detective Kelly Blue. How do you spell the last so, name? How do you spell the last name again? B L U T H Bluth. Bluth. Okay. All right. So that following Sunday, coincidentally, I was at the jail doing something else. And I run into OBS working overtime at the jail. And I was not nice. And I walked to him and I said, I have a question. I said, How can you guys keep fucking blowing me off? I go, I've been bringing you information. And these guys trying to pit out underage girls. I go, which is your big, you know, talking point on the news. And I said, for over a year now. And I go, you guys have just completely blown me off for over a year. You've done nothing. You haven't investigated anything I've told you. You haven't made any effort to independently investigate or verify any of the information I've given you. And now you've got a dead person at a place that I told you about over a year ago that was an unlicensed club. I go, I don't understand. 
And he goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I go, he goes, oh. and I go, I talked to Bruce on Monday. I go, he was supposed to come to my office. And once again, no call, no show. And he said, well, he's out of town. And I go, well, he's got a phone, doesn't he? And so he said, we'll come to your office next week. So the following week, which would have been the first week of October 2016, they come to my office. And it's Albiez, Kelly Bluth, and Greg Flores. And I give them information on a girl. The same girl I told you about earlier, whose dad was a police officer who was friends with my daughter. Okay. I give them her name, her dad's name, all of her information. And again, I give them Shane's information, where he lives, what his story is. Who was the name, ma'am? Who, who, was the, who was the name of the cop whose daughter was being pimped out? His name is Ty Bowden, B-O-W-D-E-N. He goes by Ty, like T-Y, but his first name is Clarence. Now, I had said to them when I gave them this information, every time I gave them information, I said, my daughter can never know I'm giving you information. If she finds out, she'll never talk to me again. I'll never get information again. And, you know, she might just be so pissed off that <laughs> she will never talk to me again anyway. Okay, ma'am, I, mean, I, mean, I don't want you to lose track here, but I just, before I, on a train of thought, I want to ask you a question. It's okay. Um, I don't understand. Why would a pimp be pimping out daughters of cops and a judge? It seems like the stupidest thing to do in the world. What, why was he doing that? No, actually, if you know you're protected, and it's actually not the stupidest thing in the world, it's the smartest thing in the world because I'm the only one that has ever been willing to come forward because everybody else is A, in denial about the fact that it's happening, or B, cares more about their job their political career or their public reputation than their kids. Ty Bowden, what does he do for Metro? What is, where does he work? I don't know where he works now. I have no idea. He was a patrol officer at the time. Okay, patrol officer. Okay. But no, here's the thing. you got Molly Mall paying off these cops to protect his people and his girls and go after the other pimps. Right. Shane Valentine works under Molly Mall. So he's protected. It explains, and if you've got these kinds of kids, their parents aren't gonna come forward because their parents are embarrassed. See, my embarrassment comes from the fact that we have a police department and a DA's office who will allow this to happen. They know it's happening, they pretend they don't, and they allow our kids, they allow their own colleagues' kids to get trafficked. And then they go on the news and talk about their, you know, passion for going after these human traffickers when they're sitting back watching it. I actually subsequently learned that there were cops who hung out at Top Notch at the club. With the underage girls. Mm -hmm. If someone was to talk to Marlon Brown, I'll bet he'd tell him, I actually kind of like Marlon. Marlon actually protected my daughter. Now, listen, if my daughter had been 18, I guarantee he wouldn't have. But he used to tell my daughter all the time, he's like, I have mad respect for your mom. She always treated us with respect, and we were in court, in court with her. Who is this guy? Which, which guy is this? Uh, who is that guy? He was a pimp. He was the one who owned Top Notch. But he actually, he wouldn't let my daughter drink. He wouldn't let her party. He would let her sit back there and load the hookahs. <laughs> You know, he let her hang out there, but according to her, he uh, kind of shielded her from the other stuff. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't think the guy deserves any freaking awards, but I do appreciate the fact he didn't beat my daughter up and put her out on the strip. His, his first name is Marlon? Yeah. Marlon Brown? I mean, he, he protected my daughter more than the cops did, I can tell you that. Who was the judge's name? pretty what, sad. What was the judge's name whose daughter was also being pimped out? What was her name? Michelle Levitt. Her daughter recently was working as a prostitute again out of uh, Spearmint Rhino, which is also Molly Mall's territory. Well, you just heard some very disturbing comments made by Judge Tobiason. I can understand her frustration after being ignored by the Las Vegas Metro Police vice detectives that led her to threaten Shane Valentine through his attorney. 
I have to ask this question, though. I don't believe Tobias and ever sought a restraining order against Shane Valentine, something that a judge would indeed be aware of that that avenue was available to her. As for going to Shane Valentine's house and kicking in the door, as I reported in a previous podcast, I cannot imagine what Tobias was thinking. She was fully aware that Valentine was a violent felon, and by her own admission, she knew he had firearms in his house. Trespassing on someone's property could have ended with some dire consequences. I think that was totally irrational on her part. As for allowing her underage daughter at the time to frequent and then work in an establishment that she knew involved criminal activity and was owned by pimps, well, there I have to part ways with Judge Tobiason. Her attorneys state numerous times in their motions to dismiss these and similar comments. The commission's formal statement of charges includes allegations of no substance but criticizing her parenting skills. Tobiason was acting as a mother trying to protect the victimization of a child. The commission has the arrogance to comment on Tobiason's parenting skills. In fact, Detective Grimmett understood that Tobiason's daughter was a cashier at Top Notch. My comment. Who cares? It was still an illegal establishment, and she allowed her daughter to work for a pimp. Tobiason endangered her own daughter's safety by allowing her to even enter Top Notch. I find her conduct as a mother in that instance abhorrent. She placed her daughter into the lion's den. Looking at the overall, the bigger picture here about what Tobias and said about the Metro Police vice detectives and contacting the FBI have been proven to be true. Here is an audio clip of Tobias and talking about the meeting that Sheriff Lombardo had as discussed earlier in this podcast. Listen to what she says. She could only have known what was said in that meeting from a person who was in attendance. My guess, Detective Grimmett briefed her. Just as he briefed her about an ongoing double homicide investigation that she had no business knowing about or meddling into. Or did she? More on that in another episode. Now, here's the audio. I make a phone call to somebody who I know is tight with the sheriff. And I said, I'm just worried to tell you that we think the sheriff needs to know about. And I tell him the story that I just told you. And he tells the sheriff. And the sheriff calls in homicide. And the burglary detectives who never did a search warrant, never really followed up on the information I gave them, calls in the officers who closed the drive-by shooting case. And he basically makes it look to me like he's doing something. Who was the guy that who was like, the guy that you told or told the sheriff? Kirk Hooten. Who? Kirk Hooten. Kirk Hooten. Is it what what, what 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 rank is he? Um, I'm, I'm a little, uh, okay, sometimes, sometimes your voice fades out, I don't know why, but I got you, I think now. Try it again. All right, can you, yeah, now, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you now. Kirk Hooten, right? You, Kirk Hooten, H-O-O-T-E-N. And he's a, uh, a, a sergeant on Metro? No, I say he's not, I don't think he's from, I don't know what his rank is, I don't think he's promoted to anything, he's just a friend of Joe Lombardo's. He's now works at the uh, PPA. Okay, the LB PPA. So he's just a regular cop. Okay. As far as I know, I don't know. Okay. He's been there forever, but he's kind of, he's like Joe's best friend. Okay. So I go to him, I tell him, he takes it to Joe. Joe calls in the homicide detective. Joe calls in um, the uh, burglary detective. He calls in the vice detective, asks them why they, you know, what they did in response to my information. And they basically tell him that the only thing they ever did was walk into Top Notch one time, acknowledge to him that it clearly 
was not a legitimate business and then acknowledged to him that they did nothing else even though they knew it was not a legitimate business okay what so what time that, frame are we talking about here that they this guy went to lombardo what month and year are we talk about it was within a week that i found out about shane being a suspect so that was um 2016 what month november okay so then he has the conversation with them he then sets up a meeting with me i go in there a meeting with you and, and Le- you, you. with you and joe lobato yes Marlon brown is incarcerated in nevada state prison on multiple felony counts unrelated to top notch i reached out to Marlon brown and i will discuss that on a future podcast right now i want to address this In April of 2018, as I mentioned in a previous podcast, Judge Tobiasen appeared in a news segment on KLAS-TV 8 News Now, Las Vegas, where she was discussing her problems with Metro Police Vice. We now know those comments were factual. I said in a story that I authored in 2019 that Judge Tobiasen is the first judge that I know of in the history of Las Vegas to publicly speak out about alleged police corruption. The mistake she made is that if you are going to be a whistleblower, then you have to go full throttle. I know that from my own personal experience in police work. Tobiasen had the opportunity to do just that, but she backed off, which is the worst thing to do when exposing alleged police corruption. Now, Tobiasen is facing a slew of administrative disciplinary charges that could get her removed from the bench, and also alleged criminal conduct that could put her in prison. We will have to wait and see how this plays out. Listen to Judge Tobiasen telling me about what happened to her after that interview aired on Las Vegas TV. I just finished in response to the airing of that story, five days later, Joe Lombardo, Steve Wilson, the district attorney, Chris Lawley and Robert Daskus, the two assistant district attorneys, and a guy by the name of Jim La Rochelle, who is Joe Lombardo's personal lieutenant, have a secret meeting with my chief judge, who's the chief judge on Las Vegas Justice Court, trying to get me kicked out of my criminal calendar, but they want it to be a secret. They don't want me to find out about it. They want Joe Bonaventure, the chief judge, to come to me and say that he saw the news story and he thinks it creates an appearance of a bias against the police department and the DA's office. Right. And he's losing me to all civil cases. Well, he doesn't do that. He advises me about the meeting. And he tells me that as long as I say, I go, I don't have a bias against the police department. I said, I feel sorry for the other 95% of the officers who have to work with the 5% that are corrupt and the sheriff. I said, in no way, do I think the entire police department is corrupt? I go, I think they're terrified, you know? But so I find out about the meeting and then an article gets written about it. Joe Lombardo has a meeting with George Knapp where his veins are popping out of his neck because he's so mad. Right. And he's accusing me of being inappropriate. But he's yelling at George Knapp for doing the story because it makes them look bad. And That's where we're at. So Joe Lombardo is so angry that God only knows what he's going to try to do. But their meeting was so inappropriate that I've had three attorneys tell me that I should file a federal lawsuit. Now, that is not what I want to do. I have no interest in that. Here's what I have interest in. Something happening that shows what these guys have been doing or not doing that allows these girls to get trafficked. So, according to Judge Tobiasen, Sheriff Joe Lombardo was angered at KLAS-TV 8 News Now's I-Team reporter George Knapp because Knapp aired the story that portrayed his department in a bad light. I would have told Lombardo to go to hell. Sheriffs do not control the media, but apparently from what I've been told here in Las Vegas, they do. Get some guts, Las Vegas media, and stop being a public relations firm for the police department and start doing your jobs. An investigator follows the facts to uncover the truth. A judge, just like a sheriff, is a public official 
who are elected by the populace, neither one is above the law. I stand by the following story. On January 25, 2019, the Baltimore Post-Examiner published an article that I had authored titled Las Vegas Judge Melanie Andrus Tobiasen Who Exposed Police Corruption Faces Constant Retaliation. Here are some excerpts from that story. Las Vegas Township Judge Melanie Andrus Tobiasen, the first judge in the history of Las Vegas to publicly speak out and expose alleged corruption in the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and the Clark County District Attorney's Office, was immediately rewarded for our efforts by county officials. Not in your wildest dreams. Las Vegas lived up to its nickname of Sin City, and those in power wasted no time in attacking and retaliating against Tobiasen. What makes it worse is that what Tobiasen was speaking out against was what Las Vegas was built on, vice and corruption, the lifeblood of the city. Apparently, nothing has changed since the days when Bugsy Siegel first broke ground for his Flamingo Hotel. The only thing that changed were the faces of those in power behind this fake oasis in the desert. A sordid tale of murder, corrupt cops, human trafficking, underage girls recruited into prostitution, some the daughters of judges and police officers, and a county prosecutor's office handing out soft sentences to local pimps. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why. Money in corrupt cops' pockets and God knows who else's. Corrupt cops become criminals wearing badges, disgrace their uniform, their profession, and their honor, which most likely they never had in the first place anyway. What Judge Melanie Andrus Tobiasen did was with those with testicles between their legs and stars pinned on their chests should have done years ago, but didn't have the courage to do so. On April 13, 2018, 8 News Now I-Team aired an interview with Tobiasen, who recalled her efforts starting in 2015 to keep her daughter away from the clutches of a local street thug, violent felon, and known pimp named Shane Valentine. She started to collect information about an after-hours establishment that her daughter was working at. What she found out was that local pimps were recruiting underage girls just like her daughter, including children of judges and cops, to sell sex. She recounted her efforts to reach out to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department vice detectives, but could not get any help. She realized that if the vice cops would have investigated her tips, they would have been investigating the criminals the police were working with. She also had concerns about recent plea deals for sex traffickers that were handed out by the Clark County District Attorney's Office. Tobiasen said during the interview that she was concerned for her daughter's safety. Quote, The problem is I don't think we're in danger from the pimps anymore. I'm more afraid of the vice detectives than those who are trying to cover this up. That's what I'm afraid of now. Unquote. I give Judge Tobiasen an A for coming forward and exposing corruption. I give her an F, though, for allowing her underage daughter to even step one foot into those clubs. That, to me, is just plain irresponsible and something I cannot accept. Tobiasen's husband, a retired LVMPD police officer, appears missing in action on all of this. On April 17, 2018, just four days after Tobiasen's interview we had on Las Vegas television, Clark County District Attorney Steve Wilson along with Assistant District Attorneys Robert Daskus, Christopher Lally, and Clark County Sheriff Joe Lombardo, the head of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, had a secret meeting with Chief Judge Joseph Bonaventure of the Las Vegas Justice Court. The, the, purpose, excuse me, the purpose of the meeting was to have Judge Tobias and removed from the criminal calendar and reassigned to civil cases, alleging that she was biased towards the LVMPD. Bonaventure did not reassign to Tobias I found that failed retaliatory attempt by that group of men rather pointless since Tobiasen stated during her television interview that, quote, it's unfortunate because it's a very small percentage of the people in the DA's office and at Metro, but it makes the entire system look corrupt, unquote. Not satisfied with their first attempt of retaliation, Judge Andrus Tobiasen in November 2018 would once again face the ire of those in power this time from the Nevada Judicial Discipline Commission. In what I call the biggest load of crap ever to be dumped on anyone's desk, the commission alleges that Tobiasen improperly used her position as a judge to contact Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department vice detectives regarding her claims of sex trafficking at an after-hours unlicensed club, which, according to Tobiasen, was frequented by off-duty LVMPD police officers. Must have been the allure of the underage girls the pimps had inside those clubs for the police officers. The commission's bullshit argument is that Tobiasen had access to speak to the vice detectives 
and make those requests to investigate the clubs because of her position as a judge. I look at it this way. The police didn't follow up on Tobiason's request, and she was a sitting judge. I can only imagine how they were conducting vice complaints from a private citizen. Pardon me. They couldn't and wouldn't have followed up on anybody's complaints because they were being paid off by the pimps who were operating the clubs. Trafficking in underage girls, how can this be tolerated in any criminal justice system? It's a travesty of justice, even the city of sin. How about that for a perhaps more telling investigation?